Hello, it's my very great pleasure to present Bank Islam with three prestigious awards from International Banker. Best Islamic Bank, Malaysia 2014, Best Customer Service, Asia 2014, and joining me, the CEO of the year, Asia 2014, Zukri. Very pleased indeed to have you with me, and many congratulations on these awards. Thank you, uh, Simon. And um, first and foremost, I would like to thank the International Banker for honouring us with such an honour and privilege. But of course, uh, I owe a lot of success to the uh, people around me. And then first and foremost, basically, it's the staff of Bank Slum who has worked so hard and have given all their best to achieve what we have achieved today. And uh, of course, um, we also to thank our customers who have been supporting the bank uh, through thick and thin. And a big thank you to, to all of them. And hopefully, they'll continue to support us. And um, again, um, with this award, hopefully that you know will spur Bank Islam to work even harder to give the best service to our customer. Thank you. Well, Zuckri, let's think about that idea of working harder. In terms of the kind of efforts you think that are needed to improve the understanding of Sharia compliant finance and Islamic banking, what are the key things do you think that are needed to kind of make that happen? I think the first thing that we need to do is basically do education. Even we take, for example, in the case of Malaysia, we started Islamic finance in 1983 with the establishment of Bank Islam being the pioneer bank. But until today, 30 odd years over the road, uh, there is still a so-called misconception where some segment of the market feel that Islamic bank is only meant for Muslim. Right? I think that's need more sort of education on the part to make sure that uh, the message is put loud and clear that Islamic banking is, is for all. And uh, the second thing is what we need to do is basically to make sure that you know, those countries who are not now practicing Islamic finance to market it in a different way. Because sometimes the word Islam can be quite, quite sensitive. You know? Probably the way we should market to those countries where the majority of the people are non-Muslim, as we call it maybe ethical banking. After all, all the values that have been propagated by Islamic banking are actually universal values, i.e. you don't allow gambling, you know, you're not allowed to take excessive risk taking, you're not allowed to do speculative element. I suppose there are universal values which is applicable to everybody. And do you think um, that those kind of core propositions will enable Bank Islam to expand globally with, with that kind of messaging and that kind of offer? Yes, I think certainly it's, 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 it's a way forward for us, but, but being a bank which is relatively small in size compared to conventional counterpart, we have our own preference. Of course, we do want to basically have ambition to actually start operating outside Malaysia, but we have to basically choose and pick. Mm -hmm. For the time being, our strategy basically, apart from Malaysia, we want to go somewhere near to homes, all right? So I think countries like Indonesia, for example, is, is very interesting with the population 240 million and majority are mus Muslim. So it's something that we are closely, uh, closely watching. The other consideration for us is basically that before we can operate, I think there is a need for a country to have the basic infrastructure for Islamic banking to, to flourish. And uh, the top agenda basically is the demands of Islamic Banking Act without which actually we, we cannot start Islamic Bank, especially for Bank Islam where we are actually retail based. So in fact, when you were talking about uh, the awards earlier, you were talking about your customers. How much of your business rests with the retail customer? Uh, currently, if you look at our balance sheet, uh, close to 74% of our customers are actually retail, meaning that mainly people who borrow to buy house, you know, prefer personal financing or to buy cars. But having said that, I think we need to rebalance our portfolio. I think at the management level, we have looked at it and we so-called anticipating that there could be more macro potential policy that may be introduced by the central bank to basically slow down the growth of the so-called household debt. We may have to look beyond uh, retail. So I think the idea basically now is to diversify a bit to go into 70, 30 probably and 70% retail and 30% uh, will be focused more on corporate and commercial. And in, in any sense, does the kind of regulatory climate need to develop to help you do that? I think certainly we, we, we do not want to see what happened during 1997-95 crisis, where I think it home, actually every country in the Asian region, including Malaysia actually, so-called suffer from the, 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 the problems. So I think there is a need for more regulation, especially in the areas of risk management. I think in Malaysia's context, I think prior to the 97 financial crisis, there was very little emphasis on risk management. But mm -hmm. today, it becomes the order of the day. So I think certainly that uh, regulatory 
so-called control is important. But of course, it should not be done in a way that is over-regulated. Then it will basically stunt the growth of the industry. So you have to balance between growth and actually regulation. And where might you find some specific growth areas? I think if you are talking about Islamic banking per se, I think while uh, the statistics show that Islamic bank has been growing globally at more than 20% per annum, but I think it's more towards skewed toward the Sukuk market. So there are certain niche areas where basically Islamic bank has not penetrated, one of which is basically the area of wealth of fund management. If you look like today AUM, I mean, asset under, under management for the Islamic finance, Islamic bank is very small, not even 1%. So I think this is one area that basically the Islamic bank needs to be, be more focused. And it will be interesting to see, for example, like Brunei, are started with so-called the uh, Islamic law, and they are now, actually, a lot of the assets are being parked in the conventional so-called asset. So we'll be interested to see how, basically, they want to move this back to the Sharia compliance uh, asset. And, and you are, in fact, an Islam bank working quite hard to move from principles to compliance. Is that right? Yes. Uh, technically, actually, there are, there are two, two types. What, basically, we are doing now, actually, is that it is basically, we mirror the conventional product, right? And then we make it that such a way that it is actually Sharia compliant. So that is the old way of doing things. But there is now a new thinking. of Instead of Sharia compliant product now, I think the bank now is not should move into basically what they call a Sharia based product. Meaning that we are moving from the so-called debt based model to equity based model. Right? Equity based model meaning that you know the bank should take more active role in a true blue so called resharing. For example, like Musharaka and Mudarabah contract. Whereby under the Musharaka and Mudarabah contract, actually the bank basically participated in equity participation. If there is a loss in the venture, the bank too basically have to suffer their share of their uh, so called uh, equity. Right? So I think that's the, 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 the wave now. I think they are moving towards that direction now. And given what's happened to the kind of global banking industry, there are some strengths, aren't there, in offering that kind of model and offering that kind of product? Yes, uh, certainly. I think because that basically a new, new perspective. But before that can happen, you must really have basically a product basically you can cater for that needs. Currently, yes, we do have. But sometimes also it, is, it takes two to tango, so to speak. For example, that like I may offer a cust my customer, okay, I have this product where I actually share with you the profit and loss. If there's anything wrong with the venture, the bank basically will lose the money. But some good customers say, hey, look, if I can go to the conventional way or I can do through the conventional way of Islamic where if I promise you a return of 15%, that's it. I don't want to buy share profit. If a good venture like that, they say, no, look, I, I don't want. I let, let go to the traditional way of doing it. So basically, it takes two to tango. So there is a need for understanding by both sides. And do you think that's um, one of the things that you brought to your role, that, that kind of sense of perspective of, of sharing and how that works? Is that one of the, the kind of things that you feel you rely on in terms of uh, running a successful operation? Yes, certainly to me, success basically should be shared by all parties, right? And in the case of Bank Islam, it's, it's very clear. Uh, I think uh, we have done pretty well. And along the way, I think that uh, we have actually created value for the staff as well, where we created a lot of opportunities. And I used to sort of um, remember that when I first joined, joined the bank, and uh, the bank was very much run like a, a public sector, uh, whereby, you know, uh, performance is not taken into consideration. You have a standard rule for everybody. If the bank declares one month bonus, everybody will get one month bonus, whether you work or you don't work. But now we actually bring in a new culture where we say that we will pay you by performance. If you do well, actually the company grows and you'll ensure that we will share the wealth with you. So you actually joined the bank in about 2006. How did that journey start for you? <laughs> well, it is something basically that uh, I have not actually asked for and I've never sort of, you know, uh, intend to, 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 to actually lead Bank Islam because I know that um, the bank was, was in trouble. But uh, one fine day, uh, I, got, I received a call from a very senior officer at the Central Bank of Malaysia uh, asking me to go to Bank Islam. They said that Bank Islam is in trouble. I think now you need to do whatever you, you know, try to help the Bank Islam. But I said, well, I just had uh, my national duty. I just completed my seven years with Dana Harta, which is a national asset management company formed by the government during the 97 financial crisis to actually absorb all the non-formula banking system. It was a retiring journey. We just closed down the Nata because it was successful. Now they asked me to go to another place. I said, no, 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 uh, no not anymore. I want to take a breather. But a couple of days later, I got a call. They said the then Prime Minister, actually, Tun Abdullah Badawi, basically have given instruction 
to go and see what I can do and try to salvage Islam. And that's, that's so the kind how, of call you can't really ignore, isn't it? Yes, it's something that I can't really ignore <laughs> because deep inside me also, I think as a Muslim, that I think it's now duty bound for me to use whatever knowledge that I have tried to salvage the bank. Because I know that if anything happened to Bank Islam, being the pioneer Islamic bank in Malaysia, if they were to collapse, I think the repercussion could be quite, quite great. But, but given um, the challenge of, of a bank in that kind of position, how did you set about? What, what was the first thing that you did uh, in terms of, of moving it forward rather than watching it fall over? Okay, I think the, the bank was totally in, in a big mess. You know? as, as I said, that, you know, one year before I went in, there was really a loss of half a billion. And when I joined the bank on the 9th of June 2006, the year end is June 30th. I know there's going to be another round of uh, big loss which they are going to, um, to announce. And it's triple the amount. So deep in my mind, basically, that the first thing I need to basically is to prevent from what we call a bank run. Because the moment you announce these kind of losses, it's going to wipe out the entire capital of the bank. So what should I do, right? To make sure that when we know this loss, that the bank can go on as usual. And of course, we have to do a lot of things. And basically, I engage with all the stakeholders. So start with, with all the big depositors. So we went to see all the big depositors, basically telling them that this is the situation of the bank, but don't look back. What point you look forward? And I, as, as, as a CEO, I, th I have a business plan, trying to turn around and try to convince them that, please give me a chance opportunity. So having said that, then we went to see basically the regulators, try to convince the letters that, well, we will try to do what we can do. And of course, we asked for some support from the regulator in case there is a need. And not forgetting, I even went to the, see the politician, the members of parliament, the backbenchers, to basically, because you know that uh, they are, can create trouble if they want to, basically explain to them, these are the decisions the bank is in, was in, but what is our plan to do it and back to them basically give me the opportunity. And finally, it's actually the papers. I have to go and visit all the so-called the editors, the major newspaper in Malaysia to explain to them what really happened, what is going to happen, you know, and what's our plan going forward. And thanks God, I think everybody was so supportive. So I was proud to say that when we announced another round of big loss of close to 1.4 billion, and uh, we didn't see there's no run the bank, not only that, but we see actually our deposit went up. So we're, we're I mean, we're recognising that uh, kind of leadership quality in you. Over the time you've been with the bank, you've got past that moment. What, what do you think your other biggest achievement has been? Well, of course, apart from that, uh, I think that we have actually managed to turn on the bank within 12 months, all right, from loss-making entity. I think we made a record profit in 2007. And since then, we, we have never looked back and we have been charting a new record um, every year. Uh, since then, and from being one of the worst bank to have, the, I will say, the non-performing finance or non-performing loans, at that time was about 20%, today we are one of the best in the industry. So I think that, that's a great achievement. The, the other thing that struck me too, looking at uh, the bank, is <coughs> the innovation. You're, you've, you've spotted that mm -hmm. um, you know, the world we're living in is becoming more digital, it's becoming yes. less cash. Yes, yes. Where, where have you got to in terms of coping with those new innovations uh, from yes. the banking point of view? Certainly, especially if you are doing retail banking, I think innovation is, is, is very important because customers need and want change almost every day. What is applicable, say, one year down the road is not applicable today. So innovation is really important. I think we spend a lot of money on IT. We enhance our IT system to make sure they're able to, to cope with the new product that we want to launch. For example, that uh, we were actually the first one in Malaysia, be it conventional or Islamic, to launch what we call mobile banking. Mobile banking, the true blue mobile banking in the sense that there is no, no need internet connection. Right? You can do actually banking um, 24 hours a day, seven days everywhere, so long there is actually a signal, telephone signal. So we were the first ones to, to, to do it. Mm. So innovation basically is, is the key to survival, and uh, you need to do that in order to stay ahead of the curve. And thinking, c comparing that to say the Islamic banking uh, as a kind of banking principle, what do you think is going to happen to Islamic banking over the next five years? As you kind of you march forward with innovation yes, and technology, yes, yes. where where will Islamic banking move forward? I think there is going to be a lot of changes uh, uh, taking place. I think uh, first and foremost, we are just like our conventional counterpart. We are looking at the Basel uh, Basel Committee, and I think there will be more regulatory so-called uh, prudential policy come out in terms of the governance, in terms of risk management, capital adequacy. I think more to come. So in this respect, the, the Islamic Bank is equivalent is what called IFSB, Islamic Finance Service Board. 
who is basically responsible for setting up the standard. I think they will be coming up with with more so called uh, standard uh, to just follow the, the the conventional counterpart. And in in many ways, Bank Islam is seen as a kind of pioneer in the industry, isn't yes, it? Yes, yes. Um, so, w what do you think you need to do to kind of keep that position and keep moving forward? Well, again, as I said, that uh, as a pioneer bank, uh, we need to keep not only be happy what we have done in the past, but I think we need to basically keep on innovating. All right, we need to come up with new ideas, new products. For example, now in the case of Bank Islam, with this introduction of new act in Malaysia now, they call it Islamic Financial Services Act where now basically the bank are supposed to segregate between the investment account and the deposit account. Mm -hmm. For example, in the past, which is currently, uh, if you actually save in Islamic bank, but you go for the kind of called Mudarabah, which is actually a profit sharing, right? They give you a percentage for every one dollar the bank made, certain percent goes to, that's called Mudarabah saving. But now, under the new so-called act, if you go for that account contract, it is no longer deemed as saving. It is called now investment account. If investment account meaning that the capital are no longer guaranteed. All right? But of course the customer will expect basically higher return because mm. you are deemed to be investment. So what we need to do basically customer education and we need to find new product to cater for the customers who want to have that kind of flexibility but they want to remain as a deposit. So that's the thing that we're doing. So I'm, I'm getting the impression that uh, you're very customer focused. What uh, kind of philosophies in life have kind of helped you support uh, your leadership role in the bank? Well, I think initially when first Islamic Bank started, I think a lot of our customers are basically banking with Islamic Bank because of conviction. Because they said they are Muslim, they said they want basically to have a share a complaint bank to, to bank with. And in that process, I think they don't mind a little bit of, I would say, even in terms of profit sharing, a little bit lower compared to conventional, the services a bit slower, for example, they don't mind. But I think as the years goes by, we now we have a new generation of people who are actually Muslim, but basically they are more sophisticated in the sense. I think uh, we, we cannot rest on the laurel now. I think they too expect us actually to move as fast, even better as, as conventional bank. So there is some changes in terms of so-called the mindset of the people now, all right? If those days, as I said, people don't mind because they said they want just a Sharia compliant, but today they want a Sharia compliant, but as good, it's not even better than conventional banks. Now, um, I've got a couple more questions for you. One of them is your leadership style. How would yeah. you describe that? To me, I actually look at people's strengths. I think all of us are born basically with weaknesses. There are plenty of them. So my role as a leader basically is to identify where my staff strength is and put them at the right place to suit to befit their strength and nurture them to become the leaders on their own. That's number one. Secondly, I realized that, that as a leader, actually you have the power to influence, all right? So just walk the talk, right? And I practice that. So when I started my journey with Bank Islam in 2006, we knew that we need to do cost cutting, saving, things like that. So what I did was basically that even for my travel, I use budget align. If there is no budget line, I use travel economy class. So I would then I would expect actually people to follow. And true enough, when they say that the MD is taking budget line, what are we, you know? So everybody follows. So walk the talk. So with that, actually, you gain the respect of the people. Okay, you looking ahead for the next five years, what do you think are your next big objectives personally? Personally, of course, I would like to see that the Bank Islam grows from strength to strength. As I mentioned here, that today, Bank Islam is very much domiciled in Malaysia. Apart from we have small investment in Sri Lanka, I'm just hoping that Bank Islam actually can expand the wind further to, to set up offices or to take a strategic stake in other Islamic countries such as Indonesia, which I find it very, very, very interesting. So that's one thing I would like to see. And uh, secondly, I think uh, by comparison that um, Bank Islam or for that matter any Islamic bank in Malaysia are still very much smaller compared to conventional counterpart. To me, size does matter. I hope to see that we sum for mergers and acquisition, and um, I want to see Bank Islam become a mega Islamic bank, you know, with big financial muscle for us to actually absorb short better. Excellent. Well, I've really enjoyed our conversation today, and congratulations once again on your awards. Thank well, you very, very much. Well done. Yes, Thank you. A pleasure to meet you.